So, well, good morning and welcome back. Thank you for coming back this morning. We're going to have another good morning. I think, uh, did you enjoy yesterday morning? I hope you did. And uh, we had a good time, good time last night. I'm looking forward to what we're going to hear uh, from our guests this morning and what we're going to experience from this meeting. And uh, Dave Pierce had some, I'll get to that later. He had some good suggestions for me and uh, I'll share that later. But um, I just wanted to just have you, if you have your Bibles, um, just turn the book of Romans. I'm just going to do a quick Bible introduction this morning. I don't want to take a lot of time and preach a message. I want to leave the, the speaking to the other men that we have here today uh, for in the bulk. But uh, if you've kind of picked up on where we're going, uh, does anybody remember the theme of yesterday in general? The word first, right? The word first. The word first. So the, we talked about the priority of the word and I think you've kind of figured out there's kind of two priorities. And uh, for us here at HBF, God's solidifying that, that we, we need to be preaching the word and we need to be publishing the word, right? We need to make sure that people hear the, the, uh, uh, the verbal proclamation of the word of God. Uh, there's places we go in this world where people don't even have a Bible. They don't even have a Bible in their language. They don't have a portion of scripture. The only way they're going to hear the gospel is to have it preached to them in their language, their tongue, their dialect. And of course that requires an interpreter. Uh, there's other people that, that will, that we become those living epistles. And even though they may have a Bible, they may have a, uh, a whole Bible in their language. They may even have the Bible memorized in their heart. That was me once. I had some scripture memorized. They're lost. And it isn't until God uses a living epistle to confirm in their heart what's already there. And then God quickens them and they hear the gospel, right? And then so that verbal proclamation is really important. But then there's also the very, very important uh, responsibility. And man, did Randy do a good job or what? Of helping us understand the burden, the responsibility, and the priority of the local New Testament church to literally publish the word of God. Right? So it's not just a, a verbal proclamation, which is awesome, but it's a literal uh, printed, right? A literal um, uh, visual proclamation, taking it in the eye socket uh, for those of us that can see. Now, I will tell you, Ron Kasten, Ron Kasten reads vehemently, but he just reads with his ears. All right? So there's a, there are different people that read different ways. But most of us with eye holes and eyeballs, we need that visual word of God, Right? And that we want to see it. And so, uh, and so we have the published, the printed, the per perfectly preserved English Bible. We have the authorized version. And Randy did a great job of talking about the certainty of the words of truth. Amen and amen. So yesterday was about uh, the word first. And, you know, really, you know, uh, secretly, not really secretly, but what is all that about? Well, this strategic. The reason that we want to do that here at HBF a little inside baseball, is because we already know, we know what time it is. It's important that we know the times and the seasons. Yeah. And so uh, the Bible's clear. This is a Laodicean season. So uh, Colossians 3 tells us we got to make sure that Christ is preeminent, right? He's preeminent. So what we're doing is actually going counterculture, not just counterculture in the, in the culture at large, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil, but even among Christian culture, uh, we don't want to do what many are doing in minimizing uh, the Word. We want to maximize the Lord. We want to maximize the Word of God. We want to make that the main thing because He is the main thing. He is everything. And so, so uh, we want to be found faithful when He comes and catches us away. Uh, we don't want to be, we want to, we want to do what we heard last night. Esther got engaged, right? She understood what was at, at stake and went to work. So the preeminence, right? The priority. Okay, so so this morning, I want to talk to you about, and really, we're all going to be talking about, I hope you're, you're ready to be engaged today. So uh, I hope you get stirred up enough to participate here after a while. But we were going to talk about the first word, the first word. And, and uh, you're like, well, what do you mean? In, right? In the beginning, God? That's the first word. In. <laughs> uh, are you talking about in the beginning? Or what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about this morning, I want to just, uh, I told you to turn to Romans. I need to do that myself. Romans chapter 10. Um, for all of us here, if you're saved, and I, I presume most of you uh, probably have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been born again. And so how did that happen? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. The Apostle Paul writing to the Romans says, in a very familiar passage to most of us, Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, 
uh, how, shall, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And is it written, and as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So, uh, can you remember, all right, uh, let's, let's kind of separate out all the, the big picture stuff that Randy and I were bringing forth yesterday. And can you remember the first time you heard the word? And it's interesting when you start to thinking about, if you're like me, you think about, when was the first time I heard the word? I can go back in my memory, in my recesses. I can remember uh, hearing a young preacher boy. I was a little kid. And the neighbors took me to Sunday school, Susquehanna Baptist Church in Independence. And I don't know what the kid said. He was like a 14, 15-year-old preacher in his suit. Back then, everybody wore suits to church. And, uh, and he's up there, and he's just, he's just pacing like this, man. He is just going back, and he's screaming about something. I don't even know what it was. I just know this. It affected my heart. That's the, remember, that's the first time I remember the word. And it was associated with the little preacher who, at the time, I was a little dude sitting cross-legged on the floor or whatever. I was just like... You know, it wasn't long after that I started praying to God. Because even at five, six years old, I was already into sin. You know? I'd already seen things I shouldn't have seen. I was into things I shouldn't have been into, and I knew it. My little conscience was telling me, you're a sinner. And then later on in life, I, I, I uh, went to a Sunday school. I can remember going to the Sunday school class. And young couple, uh, they didn't have the same doctrinal beliefs as us. They were actually believed in baptism for salvation. Um, I didn't know that. I just went to the little Christian church down the street. They had a VBS and um, the neighbors across the street, some crazy Pentecostals. They had some crazy Bible studies. It had nothing to do with the Word of God. I didn't want anything to do with that. But you know what? These people down the street at, the, at this Christian church, they were actually kind and they, they cared. They cared about us little kids. And they brought us in and they did VBS and Sunday school. And the next thing you know, they had us memorizing Scripture. And so I memorized this verse. I was nine. So, you know, the diff when you're a little kid, the difference between five and nine is like, you know, 20 years. But, but you know, I look back, and like, that was only a few years later. It seemed like forever. So I was nine years old, and I, and I memorized this verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I memorized that at nine years old. And at night when I would get scared, um, because there's a lot of things in my life that were getting increasingly dark. And it wasn't just the lights out in the room. I would get scared and I would quote that verse like a Roman Catholic. And I would just throw it up over and over again. It was my little, like, rosary. I only had one bead on my rosary. <laughs> and it was John 3.16. <laughs> and I would just repeat it to God over and over again. And I had no idea what it means. It was about that time. I remember being 10 years old. And uh, I went in and I... I uh, was just in fear. I was in panic one night, and I won't get into all the reasons why, because uh, it's not important right now. But I can tell you this. Uh, God was working in my life, and the devil was working, even at that young age. And, uh, and I, I, I was in fear, because I wasn't sure I believed in God. And I, I confessed that to a relative. I said, I'm not sure I believe in God. And uh, I was told, that's your problem. That's a problem. That's a problem, and it's your problem. You better get that right. I had no way to know how to get it right. I had John 3.16 resonating in my heart. I had no idea what was going on. And of course, you know, as you go through life, what happened from that day forward, actually, I got increasingly self-righteous. Even though I wasn't in church, and even though I wasn't in a, you know, independent fundy deal, you know, making a bunch of rules and regs, I was making my own rules and regs, and I was making my own uh, code of, of uh, morality, and, uh, you know, the do's and don'ts of life and the, the, the things you'll cross and won't do, you, things that you will cross and things you won't cross, boundaries that you'll go to and boundaries that you won't go over. And uh, just becoming a Pharisee, man, all over. Without, without, any, without any Bible, I was becoming a Pharisee. And guess who the judge was? Me. Guess who God was? Me. Growing up in a humanistic culture, you know, coming up through the 70s and the 80s. Man, I'm God. I get to judge. 
you know, very pluralistic environment, just like today, nothing's changed. So what happened? Now, what happened is what we're talking about today. Somebody did not forget to preach the gospel. And so the first time I really heard, now that's not to, to by the way, minimize all the other seeds that have been planted. I just want to praise God. Thank you. You know, I'm not, you and I are not obligated to hear the gospel. Uh, I mean, praise God we get to hear it one time. But in my case, I remember my aunt gave me a Bible uh, when I was a teenager. And I, it was some RSV, I think. And I went through it. I went through the plan of salvation and read every verse. Couldn't understand it. It's like Greek. And then at one time I picked up my Bible. This is right before I got saved. And I, not right before I got saved, but a few months before I got saved, and I started reading it from Genesis. You know, I got through about the first chapter, <laughs> snooze fest, I was done. The word wasn't quick. It wasn't alive in my heart. And some of it, what I was reading was, by the way, corrupt, because uh, it was bad, bad translation, but God would have used it if I'd have been open to it. And so what happened is this uh, guy, this drafting teacher I had, uh, responded to a conversation we were having in our drafting class. We were talking about AIDS being a Bible plague. I wasn't in the conversation. I was just listening to a bunch of these dope smokers. And, uh, and so they knew much more about the Bible than I did. You know, I didn't know what they, I was like, huh. My grandpa told me once, he planted a seed. He said, the world's going to end by fire. Well, that helps comfort a little, little tid. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Actually, that's what God needed. I needed a little fear. <laughs> he needed to transfer my fear to the right place. And uh, so they started talking about this stuff, and I'm like, hmm, okay, the world's going to end by fire. That's what Grandpa said. These guys are talking about the world, these, this AIDS being a, a, a plague of the book of Revelation, and it's a disease that God's brought on the earth, you know. And I'm like, I can see God wanting to destroy this place. I can see that. I'm pretty self-righteous myself. Maybe I should destroy, you know. <laughs> so uh, I could identify with that. So I, I'm like, hmm. And this teacher just kept, eventually, he kind of inserted himself. He said, guys, if you really want to know what you're talking about. <laughs> I love that. I just remember the way he addressed us. It was like, if, he didn't say it quite that bluntly, but in a paraphrase, if you really want to know what you're talking about in this little group, why don't you read... The Bible. He wasn't talking to me. He's talking to the group of people next to me. And he says, if you read the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, you'll actually know what God wants to do on the earth. And I'm like, okay, that's a good idea. So I went home and I read it. I read the book of Daniel and I read the book of Revelation. Guys, I'll tell you what. That was the first word. I received it. As a matter of fact, I wasn't going to share this, but I'll, show, I'll tell the word. I'll show, share quickly the, the verse that God gave me. It wasn't, for God so loved the world. Um, it was this verse. I've got to remember words. I wasn't going to, so I've got to give me a second here to find it. I'm getting nervous. I'm like, oh, I wasn't going to share that verse. Uh, hang on a second. Book of Revelation. Yeah, here it is. Revelation chapter 6. Go out and witness today. Use this verse. <laughs> verse, uh, start in verse 14. Well, I'll start in verse 13. So I'm reading along. I've read Daniel. doesn't mean anything. I don't even kind of get it. I'm like, whatever. I go to Revelation, open it up, start reading. I'm reading it. And I'm captivated. I get to this passage here, verse, uh, around verse... 13, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, and, and a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Okay. And heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men of the rich, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Beloved, that was a word. 
fitly spoken for a self-righteous heart of a teenager. And even though I did not quite understand all of the details around it, I didn't understand any of it, that spoke to my heart. Because as a kid, I had a crucifix above my bed. I had Jesus hanging there over my bed when I was a little boy. That's the Jesus I knew of. That's the John 3.16 I was thinking of. God loved me, sure. But then I saw the other side of the coin. And I was like, whoa. And without me knowing exactly the verse, this is what God did. He, he let me know that I was dead in trespass and sin. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Man, I got the first word I needed to hear. Man. And now I'm in trouble. I go back to school. Now, I read the whole thing through. I kept reading. I don't remember the rest of it. That's what I remember. That's what stuck in the soil of my wicked heart. And man, I tell you what, I went to school the next day. And that teacher got right on time, gathered us around, got us around a table. Because we kept talking and talking and talking. Well, they kept talking and talking. I wasn't involved in that conversation because I didn't understand it. But he got us all around because the whole, whole room got captivated by this conversation every day about the end of the world, the end of the world, right? And so we get around this table and he just goes person by person. He says, are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? And he gets to me and I'm the only one in the group. I say, no. Are you saved? Are, and he just kept going. And then he went over and he sat at his desk. After we got done and he, we went through the rest of class. I didn't think anything about it. I'll tell you, it was awesome. It was the first time in my life I can remember really being honest. I was lost and I knew it. And so he gets deeply convicted. <laughs> and he says, uh, Brian, you have to come over after class today. And so I did. Uh, now, he tells the story differently. He says he asked me to come. He did not ask me. He told me. <clears throat> Which was a good thing because if he had asked me, I probably would have said no. I wouldn't come over. He told me. I thought I was in trouble, like with him. Mm -hmm. I knew I was in trouble with God. I thought I was in trouble with Earl. That didn't surprise me. I'm like, all right, I'll be back. You know, we'll have it out. And, uh, and so I come over there. I had plans that day to fornicate. After we got out of school early, I had plans to go and fornicate that day. And I walked in there under the conviction of God, still knowing I'm in trouble with God Almighty. I don't think I can stand I'm hiding. Like, I'm like Adam. <laughs> you know? I don't understand that yet. But that's where I'm at. And I walk in there, man, and I tell you, I'll never forget the feeling of Earl just saying, hey, Brian, you remember today I asked that question you said you weren't saved? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm here? <sighs> you know? That was the first, ha. <sighs> and he's like, well, would you like to know how to be saved? And I'm like, yes, I would. Can you show me that? Yes, I can. And so he just opened the Bible, man, and walked me through Romans Road. And man, that was the first time I heard the gospel. You say, well, I thought you memorized John 3, 16. I thought you read the gospel. I had. I'd read the gospel. I had it outlined in my mom's Bible from my VBS. I had all that. But I hadn't heard. I hadn't heard the word. And so I really think Earl, he, he had me kneel down, literally kneel on the ground and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't remember what I prayed. I knew I got up different. I was changed, man, from the inside out. And uh, that day, no fornication. I, you know, when I was that age, I used to, I tried to get beer. I don't know. That's just who I was then. I mean, it was like two bucks a can. And I'm like, who's got two bucks a can? That is just highway robbery. I don't want to pay two bucks a can. You know what God did that, or the devil did that day? He blessed me with a case of beer. So I, ref I refused to fornicate, and I go by the Chinese restaurant to say hi to my buddy. He says, hey, Brian, I got a gift for you, man. My, my, uh, the, the, I, the Chinese restaurant guy doesn't want to pay me uh, with cash, so he's giving me a case of beer. He goes, I can't take that home, man, because we're 16. I can't take that home. Here you go. He just loads a six can, a, a 12, or a, it was a case, a case of beer in my truck, or my car. I'm like, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm serious. That's where I was at. <laughs> I was lost, but I was, I was saved, right? I got saved. And the devil was still after me. 
So I can't take that home either, right? So I take it to my brother-in-law's house and uh, I put it in his fridge. And then, which he's thankful, because he gets a tithe off of it. <laughs> and, uh, and so then I come at break time, I come home after break or go to his house at break time and I sit down and, you know, bush beer. We're drinking our bush beers. And I'm on my second beer and I'm talking to, to Gerald and all of a sudden I'm like, we know what I'm talking about. I'm like, Gerald, Jesus is coming back. And you need to, you need to get saved, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> you need to know Jesus. And he's just right there with me. You know, I wanted to throw a few down before I go back to the, to the pizza joint. And then all of a sudden it gets foggy. Like, I'm having a hard time articulating, and my passion is just zapping right out of my... I'm struggling. Not because I'm like fall down drunk. I could handle two beers, no problem. But the spirit was quenched. I didn't quench my thirst. I quenched the spirit. I hadn't heard one Bible sermon on this. And I got up and I said, you know what? I'm done with this, man. It's affected my ability to communicate about Jesus. And it was it, by the way. Amen. That was it. Now, I, for those that struggle with alcoholism and stuff, I'm not, I understand. It ain't that easy for everybody. Alcoholism, I drank a lot, but it was not my vice. I mean, God just took it away. No problem. And so it was gone. But what, what God did is it was, the, it was the word, man. The word of God is that powerful. When you receive the gospel, it changes you. Now, if I'd have gone to a lot of churches, they wouldn't have known I was changed. But I was changed. Right? I, I couldn't articulate what I believed. I didn't even know how to act. You know, I show up at church in a t-shirt, jeans, and I'm like, oh, I guess I'm supposed to wear a different uniform. So, I changed, I, you know, I went out and got some different clothing and stuff so I fit in. And, you know, I had to figure out how to acclimate, but I knew the church was the place. Once I finally got there, I didn't get there really quickly. I don't want to share all my testimony for time's sake, but I finally got in line, finally got baptized and got going. But the, the, today, I want to just kind of quickly just kind of mention to you that we've got to have the soft soil. Look in the, real quickly, look in the book of Luke. Luke uh, chapter uh, Luke chapter 8. You can, you can, can you remember the first time you heard the word? I mean really heard the word. And it penetrated your heart. Because God's not obligated to share the gospel, but in his mercy he calls men to repentance and faith through, through creation. Right? Through conscience. But most importantly, through the, the gospel that we preach. I mean, if there's no one there, he'll use what's there, and he'll try to get people to, if they'll receive some light, he'll give them more light. But the call is for us to take the gospel and get it where it needs to go on time. And so, in the book of Luke, you guys know this, I'll just quickly want to run through this parable that Jesus is giving. Now, starting in verse 4, he says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed some, and he sowed, and some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell on a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and uh, an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, uh, and he, he that hath ears, let him, listen, hear. He that hath ears, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? So he explains the parable. He says, unto, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables. Because why? Their heart was hard. They weren't open to the word. That seeing they might not see, and hearing they may not understand. Beloved, I was already there where I was seeing and not understanding. I was hearing and not getting what was coming down. And man, is God merciful or not to give us the grace to hear the gospel? I mean, really hear it? We should be praying that God gives us opportunities to speak to people that will receive the truth. Verse 11, now the parable is this. Here it is. The seed is the word of God. That's, the, that's what we're talking about, the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. Not out of their minds, out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. If you think that we're just casually going about presenting the word of God to people, you're dead wrong. This is an active conflict with a supernatural force. It just says so. 
The devil comes and takes the seed that's sown. It's not enough to say, I've sown. Sometimes you got to go back and sow again. I can tell you the devil, came, God came and sowed in my heart and then the devil came and sowed some other stuff in my heart. And then God came and sowed in my heart. Finally, God sowed Revelation chapter 6 and that one stuck. I was like, whoa. I, I don't want to be those guys and I feel like I am. I did not know the Lamb of God was angry. And God was, without me knowing the verse, he says, yeah, I'm angry with the wicked every day. Are you willing to receive my grace? I was so glad. Isn't it so good when you get grace? Oh, oh hallelujah. I'm forgiven. Forgiveness. Oh, I don't have to do nothing? No, just believe and receive, man. The finished work, it's all done on the cross. Oh, oh, oh hallelujah. Can it be that simple? Yes, it's that simple. The hard part for me was, was not work, trying to work it out. I wanted to work my way into heaven. God's like, no, you're, you can't work nothing. Quit, die, quit trying, and start dying, right? Trust me and my finished work alone. Okay, so there's a battle. Uh, and it goes on to say, they on the rock that are, and they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe and in, the, in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they had heard go forth and are choked with cares and the riches and pleasure of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So how does the devil often steal the seed? Well, he puts on a little suit with some horns and a pitchfork and he runs around and pokes people. Or he sits on their shoulder and whispers in their ear. No, it tells you right here. How's it happen? Um... When they've heard, go forth and are choked with, here it is. This is how the devil pulls, pulls the seed out of our heart, or the people especially that we want to see receive the gospel. Cares. We care about the wrong things. Riches. The love of money. It's the root of all evil. And pleasures of this life. Hey, sin is fun for a season. It's that simple. The lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And they bring no fruit to perfection, but... But that on the good ground, are they in, in an honest and good heart? Honesty and good heart. Having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. What makes a good heart? Not self-righteousness and not overconfidence, but humility before God, realizing that, you know what? Well, I'm honest. I'm just a sinner. Saved by grace. Okay, so I want to just, just mention this because I mentioned it yesterday. Right, First Thessalonians 2, 4. As we have been put in trust with the gospel, so also we speak, right? Not as trusting, um, not as pleasing uh, God, or not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. All right, I butchered that. First Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we've been put in trust with the gospel, so also we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Right, our hearts are tried by the gospel. There was a time I, my heart needed to hear that word for the first time. I mean, fresh and new. I needed someone to come and present it one more time. I didn't deserve it, but God brought it anyway. Would we be those people to take the word to people? Maybe they're really going to hear it for the first time. What a privilege that is to, to just drop the seed in on a good soil. Somebody who's willing to receive the word, who's not going to let the cares, the pleasures, the other things of this life, the riches of this world deceive them, but God has prepared their heart to exalt his word in their life and actually believe the word as it is in truth, the very words of God. That's what these conferences are about because God wants to mobilize people that will actually give people a chance to be saved. We got to take the gospel where it needs to go. We got to get people saved. Then we got to get people discipled so they can get people saved so they can get people discipled. That's what it's all about. I mean, it's that simple. So look with me look quick like in Acts chapter 4. Notice this. This won't take me long. I'm going to just bounce through some verses so get ready to be done. Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. Notice what it says here. It says, uh, you guys know the context, the, the church is being started. Acts chapter 4 and uh, in verse 4. It, the, uh, <clears throat> Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Man, God can do great things when people Amen. hear the word. Amen. I mean, thousands of people. Okay, well, that's the early church, Brian. Okay, I know. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Acts 10, verse 44. This is Cornelius, right? You know how important this is. This is a Gentile. They're not Jews. 
they're not even get, they don't even know what, Peter doesn't even know what's going on. And, and <laughs> he's just preaching. He's getting ready to do things the way he's always been doing. And it says, while Peter, verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which heard the word. They heard the word. I mean, they didn't just hear the word. They heard the word and the Holy Spirit of God quickened them. That Peter wasn't even ready for that. He's like, we didn't have a chance to go down here and get baptized yet. Because this is how God's been working among the Jews. But these guys literally have faith in what the Word says, and Jesus just quickened them. He just brought them to life. I mean, this is like what Paul's going to write in, in Ephesians chapter 2. Amen. Yeah, that's exactly right, Peter. You're getting it. And then look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 8. The Bible says here, And when they went into the synagogue... And spake boldly for the space of three months. It wasn't just a quick drop through the synagogue here. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when the diverse uh, were uh, hardened, notice that, like Luke, like Matthew 13, their hearts were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples. He took those that would follow. That's what disciples do, is they follow the truth. Disputing daily in the school of Tyrrhenius. And this continued by the space of two years. Paul wasn't a quitter, man. He kept after it. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Verse 10, they heard the word of the Lord. Right? After they heard the word of the Lord. After they have heard the word of truth. Uh, and man, it's amazing what God does when we hear uh, the word of truth. So, look over here and we'll be, I'm going to be done. Now, in the book of Romans, the Bible talks about predestination. The Bible teaches very clearly in Romans 8, 29 that we're, we're, con, we're predestined to be conformed to Christ's image. And uh, in the book of Ephesians, Paul writing to people who are saved uh, says this in verse uh, 10 of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, I'll give you a second to get there. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. This is his introduction. And he's talking about uh, Jesus Christ, who we have redemption in him. And he's going to talk about the inheritance. And he says in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He's talking about those that are in him. In whom also we, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Right, And we know from, a, uh, from just a caveat here for anybody listening in, we know from uh, the book of Romans 8.29 that he's talking about being conformed to his image. We, we are predestined to be conformed to his image because we are saved. He's talking to Christians. Okay, moving on, verse 12. That, that we should be the pra to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted after that ye after that ye after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the holy spirit of promise Man, what an incredible thing. Which, by the way, he goes on to say in verse 14, which is the earnest, right? That It's the down payment, in essence, of your inheritance. It is the seal. It is the security until the, day, until he, until, uh, the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You have the spirit until you get your glorified body, until you get caught up to be with him and get your inheritance. It's an incredible promise. But how does that start? It starts with just hearing the word. Hearing the word. How shall they hear the word unless we preach it? How's anyone going to believe? How's the work of repentance going to happen in someone's heart and faith, believing in God's word and, and putting aside what they believe and trusting in Jesus Christ and his finished work alone? How's that going to happen if we don't preach it? So what we're going to do the rest of this session is, I'm, and, uh, and we're not going to be too tied to the clock here, but we're going to, uh, we, we'll try to get done on time, is you're going to hear from different folks that, that are really in, in actively involved more than I am, more than our churches. We need to grow in evangelism at HBF. So the, today's session, uh, we know about discipleship. We know how important discipleship is once we get catch the fish. But right now is a season at HBF and we need to go fishing. We need to go fishing. 
Uh, and so uh, I brought Lee Carter. Lee Carter's here. He came, actually. And uh, I invited him, and he came. He's really gracious. Uh, he's got a lot of other fish he could be frying, so to speak. And they, he and his family came and decided to come be here this week. So I'm excited to have Lee come up. And he's going to just share with you uh, what's on his heart in regard to evangelism. Lee, come on up, brother. Give him a good HBF welcome. And uh, let's listen intently to his instruction. <clears throat> Man, I wanted you to just keep on going. Nah, <laughs> that's good Praise stuff. Lord, I'm looking forward to it. All right. All right. Well, good morning. good morning. If that doesn't have you rolling, then I don't know what will. Oh my word! The word, right? The word first, right? Um, he like stole the outline that's not on the screen. Um. <laughs> I want you to think about exactly what, what God just did and how God just moved and what God just did in your heart. Do you remember what he said? Do you remember the first time you heard? Do you? Do you? Raise your hand if you do. Okay? All right. Now step a little bit further than remembering that. I want you to remember what the two guys walking on the road to Emus experienced. They were hanging out with Jesus. That's what he was talking about. And they didn't know it. You were hanging out with Jesus, Pastor. But you didn't know it. Man, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't. But I, as a kid, so I'm getting bare with you, all right? So, uh, as a kid, my room in the house was the darkest room. It had no windows, so if you close that door, you couldn't see the hand in front of your face. Scared to death of the dark when I was a kid. Don't like the dark, but I ain't scared of it anymore. But uh, you know what I did every night? Man, I had a great home. My parents tucked me in at night. They taught me right from wrong. They just didn't teach me where it came from. I'm in that generation. Taught great morals, you either faltered or got the snot beat out of you, right? Okay? And honestly, I didn't like disobeying my parents. That's just how God made me. All right? And so, but man, when they closed that door at night, I had never been to a church, never heard anything about God. When they closed that door at night, I pulled that cover over my head, and you know what I did? Prayed. Explain that one to me. Anybody that walks up to you and looks you in the eyes and tells you they don't believe in God, they're lying. You're born believing it. The question is what happened for them to start denying it? Okay? So, remember what that was like. They're walking with Jesus. He starts expanding on everything, man. He just breaks it out on them. He starts teaching them. He's walking them through everything. Man, the moment they broke bread, he's out of there because they recognized him. What's it say? They talked about what? Are we, are we good or no? Okay, that's all right. We'll need technology, right? They talked about the burn within them, how it burned. As who spoke? As Jesus spoke. It burned within them. That's Luke 24, 13 through 32. I don't have time to go through all of it right now, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> careful. My wife will tell you, careful. Um, <laughs> so will he. Man, what a blessing. I'm sorry, I got to do this. What a blessing, man. You have no idea how much it means to see you serving. He was about this tall in children's church. Had the blessing of getting to teach and, uh, and be part of him growing. Um, but that burn, sorry, I chased rabbits. That, that burn, do you remember that?
I know we're told, don't base what you do on feelings. And I'll, I'll echo that. But do you, do you remember that feeling they're describing? When's the last time you felt it? Remember, anytime I'm doing this, there's one, two, three, point back at me too, okay? But when's the last time you felt that? I just got up and walked up here feeling it. I experienced it last night when God spoke through this man. When's the last time you felt it? Right? We've got to live that way. With that burn. That's what we have to have. And that's what the world needs. Right? So I'm supposed to be teaching on evangelism. I am, but we got to get there. There's a message God gave me that blew my socks off. I was asking God, man, why, why don't we do it? Why am I not sharing it everywhere? And he said, because man has forgotten who I am. Man has forgotten that hell is real. And man has forgotten what I have commanded. So how did I become somebody who, and I hate talking about me. How did I become somebody who shares the gospel every day? What did he walk me through? That's the best way I know of how to share with you. Because I personally experienced it. Right? So that burn. You got to be in the word. The word has to be first. Remember the first word. And then the word has to be first. You have to be in the word. If you're going to share the gospel. You have to be living it. Feeling that burn. Right? There's only one that can give you that burn and it's Jesus. And my Bible and your Bible says in John. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was. And by the time we get to verse 14. The word became and dwelt among us. So when you say the word first, who are you saying first? Jesus first. Amen? It's either true or it's a lie. There is no in the middle. Right? So Jesus has to be first. Right? You know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but we had, have you ever seen one of them coffee table Bibles? Right? Big enough to kill you. If you pick it up, that could be your ab workout. Right? Just picking it up and setting it back down on the table. My job on Sundays, because we didn't go to church, my job was to clean that. I had to dust it off. You know why it was important to my family? It had all the pictures in it. it had all the memories in it. My job was to clean it off. Right? Word first. It's got to be more than a a keepsake. It has to be part of who we are. Okay? Um, let's go ahead and uh, are we... Amen. Thank you. These guys are amazing, by the way. So, can we advance it? So, Luke 16, 19 through 31. And we are going to turn to this one. I promise I'm going to get to some ways of sharing that I know I've seen him used in incredible ways. I promise. Okay? And if we have to, when everything's done this morning and we're done eating lunch, man, I'll roll for four hours after that if you want to. You just holler at me and we'll sit down. Seriously. I have no greater love than sitting down and having fun in the Word. Okay? Love my wife to pieces, and she knows it. But you know why we've been married 25 years? Because we both know who we love first. Okay? Um, by the way, do you have one of these yet? You ever heard of everybody, somebody, nobody? How many of you have heard that phrase? Everybody, somebody, nobody. So your church supports them, correct? So you know what's real easy for it to happen? Well, our church supports them, so everybody, somebody, nobody, right? Grab it. 
put it on your refrigerator. Take a picture of it, make it a screensaver on your PC. Put it on your phone as your background. Pray for them. They're part of your body. Right? Amen? Amen. Pray for them. Right? Seriously. All right? Don't forget that. I told you I chase rabbits. Right? That's important. Okay. Luke 16. This passage changed my life. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Do we know where we're at? You guys familiar with this passage? You're familiar with this passage? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. You ready to be unfamiliar with it? Come on now. You know what I'm saying? Be unfamiliar with it. Let him show you something different. Here we go. You ready? Put your seatbelts on. Jump to 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. Who? The rich man. Where was he? And he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. You might want to turn me down. I get loud. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. How many of you think it sounded like that? Man, we got to let this book come alive. How many of you would sit in front of a TV and watch a video that had one actor standing here, another actor standing here, and them just regurgitating their lines back and forth? How long would that stay on your TV? No backdrop, no, no ambient sound, no soundtracks, no, no sound effects, nothing else. Just two people standing there regurgitating lines back and forth. How, long, how many of you would watch that more than five minutes? You know, the average video time on Facebook or YouTube is 17 seconds that people stay on that video. Right? You wouldn't watch that. Right? We've got to let this book come out alive. Is it alive or not? Yep. Eh, I don't believe you. Yeah. Remember, I'm going to a Latino culture. Amen, brother? Right? I look for participation and involvement, right? Is this book alive or not? Amen. Is it Jesus or not? Amen. Well, then it's living, amen? Amen. amen. Man, you got to get fired up, man. There's more coffee, okay? But we got to get fired up about this book. It has to come alive. He cried, Lazarus! Is who we're talking about, Right? He cried, Father Abraham! Can you hear it? Can you close your eyes and hear it? Have mercy on me! I'm not putting on a show. I'm trying to relay what happened. This is real. It's real. He's asking for water. Understandable request, but I'm going to be real with you. A dumb one. Number one, the heat alone of hell. What will happen to that water drop as it entered? Gone. So Abraham delivers him the wonderful news that says it ain't happening. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. It ain't happening. If this next part don't get you, I don't know what will. Right? He explains why he walks him through it. Look at the man in torment in hell's request. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, will you send somebody to my father's house? Think about that. Right now, if God would allow some way for us to hear the requests of those in hell, they would be begging us, please go tell my family. Please go tell my friends. 
I don't want them to come here. This place is awful. Will you go tell them? Please. Can you imagine if one was loosed and could walk the streets? Do you think they'd ever stop proclaiming? The passage, one of the things I love the passage is about this passage, it deals with that. He says, man, if they won't believe the prophets, if they won't believe the ones who are there proclaiming it, they wouldn't believe one who come back from the dead. Now here's what that says to me. When I present the gospel, my testimony is more powerful. What he has given me is more powerful than one coming back from hell himself and walking around on the streets and saying, you don't want to go there. Amen? Man, think about what we got in us, right? Shame on us if we present this in some mundane, boring way. Amen? Amen. This half is waking up. Come on, guys. All right? All right? Seriously. Again, I promise you, I'm not putting on a show. This is how I feel about this. And that's what he's saying. Amen? Amen. Hey, uh, can, can I talk to you about the Bible? What? Hey, you know, I'd share, but, but what? Look, if Jonah can't mess it up, ain't nobody in this room that can mess it up. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. All he had to do was hit his knees and say, sorry, God. <laughs> say, no, throw me overboard. Quitter. Throw me overboard. What happened when he hit that water? What happened to the men on that ship? They surrendered to the God. He couldn't even mess up witnessing. How are we going to mess it up? By not trying. Right? I'm going to move on. I don't know if, is, is it you guys or me? Hey, praise God. All right. Real testimonies. I wasn't going to call them. I'm not going to call them for time's sake. <clears throat> Real testimonies. Um, word first. There's a group in Decatur, Alabama right now that got stuck with me. Um, <laughs> pray for them. Um, college and career aged. We call them 412 for 1 Timothy 412. All right? Um, we get them in the word first. That's what we did. We said, hey. They said, hey, we want a Bible study. Well, okay. One night. Tuesday night. Okay. Awesome. Be there. I said, but it's not going to be knowledge based. It won't be like anything you've ever been through. We're going to do it in the community. And we're going to learn How? It's going to all be about how, living it out. I said, so first thing I'm going to teach you is how to get into the word. Second thing I'm going to teach you is how to pray. But that's not static. Okay, two people showed up. Marco's Pizza. Right? That was awesome. It was a good pizza. Right? (laughs) And we started what's called Discovery Bible Study Method which I'm sure you've probably heard the terminology, a five-column process. Get them in the Word. Real testimony from those right now, I can pick up this phone, I can call them, and I can say, hey, Jonathan, what did Jesus say to you today? And he will have an answer. He will tell me what God has told him today. Not just knowledge-wise. He'll tell me what God has told him he needs to put into his life today. How that happen? He's in the Word. I can, I've got a group of 30 of them like that right now. You can literally 
call them. What did God tell you today? They'll tell you. Because they learned this book is real. That, that this is God speaking to them. So I have a handout. I'll put it on the counter out there where you walk in. Grab one. It's called Five Column Bible Study. The method, straight out of scripture. It's why it works. Bible works. Right? And so we're kind of transitioning into, hey, what are some cool things that work? So I want to show you some fruit first. Because why would you want to listen to somebody unless they can show you fruit? And the fruit better look like Jesus, right? Okay, so this guy got saved. He's at the Walmart, the small Walmart. No, actually, that's at Kroger, right? He got saved because a young man named Adam, who's in the group, said, you know what? I can't do this no more. I can't just sit around. Him and another guy named Parker said, we're going to, go to, we're going to go to the grocery store and walk around and tell people about Jesus. I'd rather go door knocking than try to do it in the retail world. That's a tough environment, right? Led this young man to Christ. This couple got saved. This is Walmart. They decided they were tired of Kroger. They ran out of people. They didn't go home. They went to Walmart. Accepted Christ their Savior. That's Parker on the left. Lady walks into what what cell company does she work for? Lady walks into Cricket, Kimberly. Is it working at Cricket? Lady walks into Cricket for a cell phone plan. Kimberly says, Yeah, he think you're here for a cell phone plan. Let me tell you who you're gonna call, right? <laughs> Look at the smile on mom. Look at the smile on mom. Look at the cheeks. Except that Christ your Savior. Oh, door knocking doesn't work, by the way. Did you know that? Right? Come on, Pastor. Right? That yeah, does. That yeah, does. Except Christ our Savior. That's Kimberly that was on the right. Oh, you can't walk up into the middle of a basketball game and interrupt it. <laughs> sure you can. You can walk into the middle of the court and say, hey, guys, let's take two seconds. If you want to know how to go to heaven, meet me over here on the side. They didn't meet me on the side. They stopped playing. <laughs> Everybody you see there except Christ as their Savior. Jonathan's in the back. Jonathan's been saved for four months. He's taught six times so far. He's taught six times so far. Led all of them to Christ. That was Sunday when I wasn't there. Amen, praise God. Right? They're hanging out on the playground with their kids. Got led to Jesus. Right? And we don't stop there. That Bible shows that discipleship starts at the point that they hear about Jesus. Well, we don't leave them sitting there. We introduce him, do, introduce them to the next step, right? That's where you do it, by the way. I don't know how much I'm probably going to get in trouble by time, but so my first, my testimony didn't know a thing. I knew Christmas was supposedly Jesus' birthday, and Easter had something to do with him. But I knew Easter meant I was going to get some candy. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I had no concept of Easter. None. Zero. Started going to church for all the wrong reasons. Heather, stand up, please. I was chasing her. <laughs> she caught me. <laughs> some of you married couples get that, all right? Going to church for all the wrong reasons. Right? First two years. First two years in church. Driving a van. Picking people up, bringing them in. Helping in the car. 
working behind that booth right back there. Different place, but different, same, same thing. I was doing everything I could do, and on my way to hell. Mm-hmm. And everybody thought I was saved. I fake dunked. Seriously. I, I had to lie about it or the pastor wasn't going to marry me. We, we, we weren't going to get married. I was lost. I'm away to hell. Don't think they ain't in your church. They are. They're everywhere. And I don't mean that bad. I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm being real with you. Right? Satan had me convinced if I got saved at that point, I'd lose my wife, all my friends, and the pastor would never trust me again. One morning, it didn't matter anymore because I didn't want to split hell wide open. I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And so then I was going through the process of what all good Christians do, right? We check off our boxes, right? I'm in a small group, check. I go on Wednesday nights, check. Oh, mission trip. Where can I go that I don't speak the language? Mexico. Check. Her grandpa. Oh, my word. God got a hold of me through her grandpa. First person I ever saw lead somebody to Christ, and he did it through a glass door at Dairy Queen. I go to Mexico thinking translators are going to have to do all the work, right? Because I knew taco and burrito. Right? Three days into this thing, everybody's leading people to Jesus but me. And I mean everybody. We're coming back after backyard Bible times, right? Celebrating fruit. Woohoo! And I'm going. Extremely competitive. I ran a 407 mile my freshman year in college and a 917 two mile. I didn't like being second. I'm sitting there, just ticked. Right? Third day into this, they excuse us early because we've been working our tails off. We go, I go back to the house I'm staying at. We're supposed to hang out with the family. I excused myself, went to the room to have my little pity party. I don't know, well, I do know why now. His mercy and grace. God allowed me to live through that pity party because that pity party was, why'd you let me come here? Why didn't you stop me? Why'd you let me waste your money? I can't speak through an interrupter. (laughs) How am I supposed to share my heart that way? God said, (laughs) you're not doing it where you can speak the language. And it broke my heart. Because he's right. He's always right. So I promised him, kind of like what uh, Moses did. I, look, I can't speak. I'm horrible grammatically. You're calling on the uneducated one. But I'll try, but you're going to have to do it all. We got back, we crossed the border. Sounds like a bad Taco Bell commercial. But I agree, brother, they're, those spicy shells are awesome. Right? So. I come back into the United States. We stop at a gas station. The gas station and food places weren't inside of each other back then. They were still separate. I go into the gas station. I'm standing in line. There's like 13 people in line. It's stacked up to the door. I get halfway up to that counter and God goes, hello. Do you remember? Remember? Remember what you told me you'd do? Here. I get up to the counter, still full line, lady behind the counter. I looked at her. I said, I am horrible about what I'm about to try and do with you. (laughs) This kind of face I goes. I said, "Uh, but I promised God and I'm scared of him. I, I really did. That's what I said. And I said, so. Do you know anything about heaven? No, it doesn't get any worse than that, guys. <laughs> you know what she did? She said, just a minute. I thought I was in trouble. She went out the door that was behind the counter. Uh-oh. And now everybody in the building is mad at who? <laughs> Me. 
me. She came out a side door a couple minutes later that come around the front. She brought two people with her. Sorry. <laughs> they walked up. She said, we all need to know. Stood right there and got saved, all of them. They didn't care about the line. I'm, I'm walking out the door, still not even sure what just happened. I'm going next door, tears in my eyes, can't see where I'm walking. It was Taco Bell, by the way. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but it was. I go in. Seven people got saved at Taco Bell. You know what I learned? It's not, it's not true that people don't want to hear. What's true is, do we want to tell them? That's what I learned, folks. Do we want to tell them? I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew who I'd promised it to and what he was able to do. And, and I wasn't looking at, the, he was able to save. That's not, I mean, I knew he was able to do whatever he wanted to do to me for not being obedient to my promise. <clears throat> Obedience. So there's three ways that are solid as a rock. One is just like that direct. It works. People are afraid of direct questions, of asking them because we think we know what's going to happen. Mm -mm. Put your eyes back on Jesus. Here is a question that took 18 years to come up with. Okay? Write this down. Okay? If your heart stopped beating right now, are you 100% sure that you will go to heaven? Not, do you know where you might go? Not, hey, what church do you go to? Not, trust me, I've got a thousand reasons why not on all those. The reason it took that many years is because I had to make all the mistakes first before I listened to, hey, this is a really good question to ask. After you ask it, be quiet and listen. Just listen. You're going to listen to two people. You're going to listen to them, and you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. Just say what he tells you to say. There's no better witness than Jesus Christ, and that's who's speaking through the Holy Spirit. Jesus knows everything about that person that's standing in front of you, and you don't. Okay? He will meet them where they're at. You will never do that in your power, but he will. Okay? And you're going to make all kinds of rookie mistakes. I still do it every day. It's okay, because he's bigger than those. Okay? It's okay. Try it. It's the first way. Second way, Pastor, I love this way. It sounds weird, but I love this way. I tried it out again at Freddy's yesterday. My wife went home, took a nap. My daughter went home, thought about taking a nap, took a nap, and they got up. God got in, let me take a nap. He said, go to Freddy's. I'm like, they got ice cream and burgers. None of that's good for me. And go to Freddy's. So I went to Freddy's. Their salad's in. So I'm sitting there at Freddy's. I got my laptop, having fun in the Word. I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to try this. So I got out the sheet that I'm going to put back there, the five-column Bible study method. I got out the sheet, I pulled out my Bible, and I, I wrote the passage, Romans 3, 22 through 26, <laughs> right? I'm like, I'm going to do my five-column Bible study, which makes no sense to you right now, but it will, on this passage. And then I looked around, I said, hey, come check this out. Can you get that excited about the word? Repeat after me. Hey, come check this out. Hey, come, come check, check this out. out. Come on. Hey, come check this there out. There we go. That's what I'm talking about right there. Even though she's wearing K-State, right? Um, but <laughs> hey, come check this out. And, and two people got up and came over. I said, look at this. Look what God's saying. And they sat down in the booth. 
Before we were done doing the five column Bible study on that passage, I had four people sitting in a booth with me. Why? Because they wanted what I had. They wanted to see it. You know what they walked away knowing? This book's alive and God will talk to you if you get in it. Did they accept Christ as Savior yesterday? No. No, they, they did not make a profession of faith. But they will. I know what's going to happen. I know what happens. Right? Five column Bible study is all through the New Testament. I see this process in five different places. When Jesus took his disciples, the first set, it says he went teaching. When do you want me to shut up by? Seriously, Pastor, I'm at your beck and call. I mean that. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> he took them teaching, and I'm sorry for using that vernacular. I apologize. My flesh comes out sometimes. I use terms that I get in trouble for all the time. Um, that's why God gave her to me, right? Um, he took them teaching, then preaching, then doing the miracles. So you see the process five different times in the New Testament where it says teaching, and then preaching, teaching, and then preaching. That first section I'm talking about, it says the fame of Jesus spread after the miracles. Miracle, very simply put, is the personal impact of Jesus Christ on somebody's life. Okay? You look at every miracle and you'll see that. The personal impact of Jesus Christ on somebody's life. That's what starts the water cooler talk, right? The guy who's always drinking and isn't anymore, everyone in the neighborhood's talking about. Why isn't he? The personal impact of Jesus Christ on his life, and then you've got the fame of Jesus, right? And so teaching, that's your knowledge, right? Most of the time you see the terminology teaching, they were in the synagogues. I think there's only one time, if I remember correctly, and I might be off a little bit, there's only one time you hear the terminology preaching, dealing with the synagogue. But teaching was in the synagogue. So the lessons, they were getting the knowledge, right? You got to have the knowledge, but if all you get is knowledge, the Bible says knowledge, buffeth up and pride comes before, right? So we know that that's not a good equation. So you got your knowledge, and then you get the preaching. What they didn't know they were getting when they were getting the teaching is they were learning how to teach. They didn't know that. Then he took them preaching. So they're getting the, they're starting to gain that understanding. When you hear the preaching, it's that pricking of the heart. It's that showing you what needs to be put into your life and, a, and gaining an understanding of, hey, go live this. So you're going from knowledge to where you're gaining some understanding. There's personal reflection and, and application that comes in. Okay? The miracles is when you take that and live it out and he is transforming you. So the transformation is the third part. Okay? So the five column Bible study is first column. You, I told him you have to pick out five verses. No less. I don't care if you do 30, that's fine. Good luck, but you can do 30. But no less than five because I want you to have what? Context. No less than five verses. So you take five verses and you read those five verses, right? In the first column, you ask yourself, what, what do I learn about God? God being the Trinity. So it could be God, it could be Jesus Christ, it could be the Holy Spirit. But you write down everything you learn about God. Second column. What do I learn about man? <coughs> you want them studying about man? Yes. I want them to understand their tendencies. We need to know that. Who are we? How are we? Right? First two columns are knowledge based. Third column. What sin do I need to run from? Or promise is there that I can claim? Sometimes there's both. Sometimes there's just one. But now you're switching. You see it's shifting gears? 
Because when you start considering sin, you start doing self what? Evaluation, right? Self-reflection. How does this apply to me? Where am I at in this? So you start looking at some understanding. You're starting to shift from just knowledge to having to, to apply it. Promise to claim. Hey, man, I like that. Right? I can take that to the bank. That's I. So there's personal. <coughs> Fourth column. What is God saying to me? In between each column, you've got to reread the passage. You know what will happen by the time you're done? You're going to know that passage inside and out. Right? <clears throat> Fifth column. That's what I call the money maker. Right? It's how you lay up treasure in heaven. Fifth column. How do I do the fourth? How do I live that out? How do I live out what God's saying to me? Not just... Here's the words of how to do it. Drill down. Really, really, really. How are you going to do it? What's it look like? If I'm at work and I got coworkers that I'm taking lunch at the same time with every week, and I start doing a five column body slay, hey, come check this out, guys. I figured out a way where you can get you can get something out of this intimidating book. Come check this out. Man, they don't need any kind of a degree. You don't have to be a king of theology. You don't need, you, all that stuff's important. I'm not discounting it. Don't misunderstand and don't let Satan do that with what I'm saying. If you can pick up this book, you can get something out of it. They just got to know how. Once you do that first week... Second week, <laughs> how easy is it going to be to take that relationship that's forming from being in the Word together and to be over to share the gospel with them? Right? It's easy. And guess what? You're not a one-hit wonder. You've established a Bible study. Right? And you get to keep discipling them. That's the next phase. Baptism, discipleship, right? Okay? It works. That's method two. First method, direct. Second method, five-column Bible study. Third method. Ready? I'm going to role play. Can I role play with you? Okay, so I come up, I knock on his door. Come on in. How you doing? Hey, I'm Lee. What's your name? I'm Joe. Joe, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Me and Mike are in the neighborhood for one reason. We want people to know that we care. We want to show you that today by praying for you. How can we pray for you and be quiet? How, how can we pray for you? Um, I'm having problems with my wife. Okay. Pray for me and my wife. All right. She correct you all the time? She does. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm right there with you, dude. All right. All right. Be real with them. And you got to mean what you're saying or don't do it. Don't knock on the door if you don't. Okay. Hmm. Trying not to get emotional. I love these guys. And so I'm not going to fake it right now. We're going to pray for them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what to do after that. Okay. Heavenly Father, I come to you now, Lord, and I thank you for this couple. Lord, only you bring people together and do what you've done through them and what you're going to do through them the rest of their lives. Lord, we celebrate the fruit that's going to happen tomorrow through them. We celebrate the fruit that's going to happen tonight when you speak through him. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for caring about that city in Mexico and for letting them be part of that. Lord, I pray that you would just fill them with so much power. They're scratching their head trying to figure out what next. Do miracles in such a way, Lord, that people are gathering around with their jaws wide open going, wow, look at their God. Protect their hearts and their minds with the supernatural protection that you can do and only you. And continue to grow them. Lord, hide them in your secret place. Right up there close, drawn next to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. And you look at them and you go, thank you. Thanks for letting us show you that we really do care. 
would it be okay if sometime in the next couple weeks I swing back through and share a story with you that changed my life? Is there a day of the week that works best for you? Time's good. Okay. Well, I don't want to fail, so let's pick one out. How about Tuesday, like between 6 and 7? Does that interrupt your dinner? We can meet at Taco Bell. Awesome. Sounds good to me, man. <laughs> right? You're setting up. You're setting up. Guess where I'm going to go today? <laughs> you're setting up a perfect time for being able to follow up and sit down with him. And what you're going to do when you do, she's just going to share a story straight out of the Word of God. Whatever one God tells you to. And then at the end of it, share your testimony. Ask them if they have one. I have a 90% appointment setting rate doing that. With people that have no clue what they're doing. Don't tell my group I said that, by the way. No, but seriously, seriously. 90%. I've never seen anything like that. All right? Three solid what methods. Out of time. <laughs> I don't even know how to, how to put into words how thankful I am for you just letting me come be part of the family. Um, I, I don't care what it looks like moving forward in the future. We just found another home. We love you guys. What God's doing here is phenomenal. Amen. Right? And I'm excited yes. about how he's using you and going to use you. You have an amazing pastor and he has an amazing wife. Right. We had the blessing of getting to speak with her a little bit last night. Everything he's praying about when he, when he says, hey, pray for missionaries this way. Apply it to your pastor and his wife, too. You guys are blessed beyond measure with who's standing in your pulpit. Amen? Yep. And I'm not doing that because he's sitting in here. I mean it. All right? I'm going to close this in prayer and, and stop before I get in trouble. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I don't know that I even did an adequate job of what you put me here to do today. I know what you promise, and you promise that your word will never return void. Lord, help us never to lose that burn that comes from you speaking. And Lord, when, when, when it's not happening, when, when we're going through a day chasing our tail, man, draw us. Don't let us be complacent to go through a day without that burn. People are going to go to hell if we don't tell them. <clears throat> Help us. Only you can save. Help us to stay out of your way, but yielded to you in your way. Just speak through us. Tune our ears. Help us to put on your mind that we'll see people the way you do. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Two handouts will be out there. The five column Bible study. And I, I put together a study. It's all scripture about evangelism that you see in the Bible. Ways that it was shared, things that were done. So they'll both be out there. Pick one up, grab it. Don't forget... I know I'm holding up their card, not mine. I'm doing it on purpose. Seriously. Seriously. I got it easy. They're there. Pray for them. Do not leave without one of their cards. Please. It's all yours, Pastor.
Amen, man. Praise God. He's that's awesome. I needed that. Thanks, Lee. He's you're here. Your family left. Your wife left. Okay, she's with you in heart. <laughs> you know, I, I, I we got a break, but um, I I just appreciate that was practical hands. I mean, if if we don't if we don't witness, it's because we don't want to. That's what it boils down to. I mean, that's what if we aren't witnessing after hearing that, because we just don't want to. We don't need a burden. Oh, Lord, give me... Yeah. I love that. I'm going to remember that. We don't need a burden. We need a burn. All right? We need a burden. I, I like that. That's that's good. Okay, well, and thanks for doing... And then he does my job. I Thank you. I want to do what he did. Pray for these people. Pray for these people. Pray for those people. Man, we need to be praying for Sid. We need to be praying for Lee. We need to be praying for Joe. We need to be praying for their ministries. And... Uh, uh, Man, thanks for thanks for showing me how to be a better pastor too. So it was all good. I I'm not I'm not a good cheerleader. I just like to drive. You know, I was a lineman in football. I just drove. You know, so I wanted to run the ball, but they wouldn't let me. So anyway, we had some really good backs. But anyway, that's another story. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, break it up here and uh, have a break. Then we're going to come back and we're going to have another session. And then at the end of that session, we're going to have a little time to just reflect on evangelism. I've asked a couple of folks to just kind of give some testimony to kind of prime our pump because not because I mean because they're doing it and I didn't have time to we could just, I could it's just cool in this room right now I could probably line up the rest of the afternoon and just have this happen again and again and again. So we are blessed. And so Heartland uh, faithfully okay to whom much is given much is required. I mean, we really got to do something with what we're hearing. So I do hope this is burning in our heart. And uh, and get the material that Lee gave us while we break. Get that in your possession. Five-column Bible study? How easy is that? Just take somebody and sit down with the Bible. Start going to town. You don't even need my permission, right? You just do it. Make it happen. And make time. All right. Uh, so go ahead. Let's take a break. We'll be back at around a quarter till. Uh, let's say quarter till. And we'll get going with the next.